In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, to a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel went to her and said, Greetings you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. Do not be afraid. For you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth your relative who is going to have a child in her old age and she who is said to be unable to conceive is now in her sixth month for no word from God will ever fail I am the Lord's servant Mary answered may your word to me be fulfilled and then the angel left her let's pray father thank you for the incredible the unimaginable the story of Christmas that, Father, you would send your son into this world to save sinners like us. That, God, you would give us your grace and your mercy and the gift of your peace and the gift of great joy. We thank you, Father, and pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Amen. Like David mentioned, at first glance, the circumstances surrounding the very first Christmas didn't appear to be very joyful. I mean, when you think about it, an unplanned pregnancy... This was not the way that Mary dreamed of starting her life off with Joseph. Joseph almost called things off, and then there's a census that's taken by, you know, given by the the Roman official Caesar. He calls for the census, and everyone knows what that means. It just means more taxes. And and, and then you've got that that census disrupts everyone's life, and Mary and Joseph are uh, forced to travel 70 miles over dirt roads from Nazareth to Jerusalem, or to Bethlehem. And 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 Mary's in her ninth month, and Mary and Joseph lived in poverty, and no one would take the young couple in when they got to Bethlehem, so Jesus was literally born in a barn. I always laugh when I read that and, and think, oh, he probably just left all the doors open at home. I don't know if your parents did that. I'd leave the doors open, my dad would yell out, were you born in the barn? And I would say, no, but Jesus was. (laughs) You know, the shepherds, they're the rejects. They're out in the fields at night. They're they're on the night shift. But despite all these circumstances, the angels come and they proclaim good news of great joy. Last week we talked about the good news. And I hope that you've been saturating yourself in the story. If you haven't been, then grab one of the copies out in the lobby or go online and get the resources. Just read the story over and over again. I guarantee you it will bring you joy. Saturate your life with that. It is the good news. And we've been, we've been kind of focusing on these two verses in Luke chapter 2 in the Christmas story. It says, the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today it's In the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And while the joy of Christmas was born out of a time of great hardship and adversity, Christmas is a time of incredible joy. All the children sense it, don't they? All the children just can't wait. And and Christians should be the most joy-filled people on earth. I mean, just before Jesus died... He, he, he gathered his disciples together, and, and he said this in, Je- in John 15, 11. He says, I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be complete. We have a God who is all about helping you have joy. And not just a little bit, but complete joy. 
C.S. Lewis says, joy is the great business of heaven. And I love that and can't wait till we're there one day. The Apostle Paul tells us that uh, in Galatians 5 that joy is a fruit of the Spirit. Christians should be known for their joy because regardless of what happens in Washington, D.C. or over in the Middle East or down at the Mexican border, no matter what happens at your work, no matter what happens at your kid's soccer game this week, or whether or not you might be an Angel fan or a Dodger fan this week, 700 million, really? The Bible tells us that despite all that, that we have a hope, a hope that can never perish, never spoil, never fade, and it's kept in heaven for us. You have an eternal life if you're a follower of Jesus, and it is kept in heaven for you. God can't wait to be with you. But far too often, I run into Christians who are not very joyful. Too many followers of Jesus are grumpy and critical and and people who are complaining all the time. I heard an illustration uh, 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 of somebody, uh, a pastor shared about his dad. Somebody asked him, hey, how's your dad doing? And he says, my dad has OCD. And he says, oh, really? Your dad has obsessive compulsive disorder? He says, no, he he is old, he is um, cranky, and he is dangerous. (laughs) And and that, that shouldn't be the descriptor of a child of God. That, that, that we shouldn't be grumpy. We shouldn't be people who complain. We should be people whose lives exude joy. The Bible exhorts us in Philippians uh, 2.14. He says, do all things without grumbling or complaining. Now, there's one to have your kids memorize, right? So wh- where is our joy? How, how do we experience, <coughs> excuse me, how do we experience great joy that the angels we're talking about that very first Christmas. Well, first, let's talk about what joy is. First, don't confuse joy with happiness. You know, we, we live in a country where, that highlights happiness, right? Because we have the right to it. Because we have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of... And man, do we pursue it. Do you know the reason that we have trillions of dollars in debt? It's not because of all of our needs. It's because of our pursuit of happiness. And we continue to pursue and continue to pursue and continue to pursue and continue to pursue. And we go into debt. We become enslaved to pursue happiness. Now, we were created. Don't get me wrong. We were created not for happiness. We were created for joy. But oftentimes, we settle for happiness. See, see, a great quote by... um, a pastor and, and teacher and author that I really like, his name is Paul Tripp, and he says this, everybody searches for joy somewhere, and God has placed this quest in our hearts. It is there to drive us to him. It, it is there because we were made for him. But sadly, in our lifelong quest for joy, most people ignore God and look for joy where it cannot be found. And because they do, they always come up empty. I mean, that's an incredible quote. We we were created to live in joy. We were created to live, you know why? Because it is the character of God. God is joy. And and he wants us to live in joy. And and there's this desire in our hearts, like he says, to to seek that. But, But we fall short and we fall for what the world says is happiness instead. And happiness is temporary. And because happiness is temporary, it's addictive. As soon as the new car smell wears off, you start looking for the next one. As soon as the next technology comes out, you're looking to upgrade. I mean, think about that. I mean, because our happiness with things fades... We start looking for the next best, and it's an addictive cycle that we get ourselves in to always have to have something better, something new, something shiny, right? We, it, we, we are just addicted to this pursuit of happiness. We keep chasing it and chasing it. Happiness is a feeling that's based on circumstances. It, it, it's based on what is, happiness is based on what is happening in your life. 
things are happening and they're going well, then you're happy. If they're not going well, then you well, not so much. I mean, happiness is based on these externals while joy is based on internals. Happiness is, uh, is a thermometer and joy is a thermostat. You guys know the difference, right? Happiness is a thermometer. A thermometer, it just reads the temperature that, 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 of, of where it's at, right? I mean, I have this really fancy uh, thermometer now. Uh, and so when, I, when, when we're using the smoker because you're supposed to just cook till it's the right temperature, right? And I got this really fancy uh, thermometer and you just take it, it, it. You know what it does? The thermometer itself doesn't change anything. The thermometer just tells me what the temperature is, right? That, that's the, I mean, hap, happiness is a thermometer. It, it just tells you what the state of things are, right? It's like, okay, I'm happy because I have these things. But, a, but joy is a thermostat. Okay, I, I, I have a, a really cool new thermostat too. One in our house, I can change the temperature from my, from my phone. I don't even have to get out of bed now, right, when it gets cold. I just lean over and, you know, go to the little nest thing and I can change it. Because a thermostat raises and lowers the temperature, right, it changes things. And that's the difference. Happiness is changed by our circumstance. Joy changes things in our life. And when we can live lives of joy, we not only, not only does it change our lives, it changes the lives of the people around us. One of the people in my life that was most joy-filled um, was my sister. Uh, my, my sister was just a person of incredible joy. No matter what was going on in her life, she just exuded joy. And, and when she was diagnosed with cancer, the first thing she told every single one of us was, this will not steal my joy. And we watched for 12 years as she battled and battled and battled. And I remember she would, she would go in, she would go in to, the, to the place where she would get her chemotherapy treatments. And, and we would go in and she would walk into the room and she would start lighting the place up. And you've got people there who, I mean, you know, a, a, a chemo lab, I mean, that's, that's not a happy place for most people, Right? And I remember one day I got to go with her and we walked, into the, walked in together and she looked around and she says, well, it's pretty dreary in this place. And she turned around, looked at me and she goes, you need to go get some pie. <laughs> and so she walked around and she just sat and she visited with all these people and she just exuded this incredible joy in her life. And, and the best part was, is I still can't even think of her without smiling. Even though she's gone to be with the Lord, because one of the last things she told me was, my, my sister, she, she had this crazy thing, it was called a bedazzler. I don't know if anybody knows what that is. It puts sequence on everything, <laughs> right? And she was like, and, and she, was, she was like bedazzling everything in our home. And me and my brothers hated it. And so this one day she bedazzled the license plate cover and we were all mad at her. And we were sitting in the hospital just before she passed away. And rather than it being an incredibly sad time, it, it, there were moments of incredible joy that we spent together. And I remember she looked up at me from the hospital bed and she says, I'm going to beat you all to heaven, and you know what that means, right? And I said, what? And she goes, I'm going to bedazzle your mansion. <laughs> and I just, like, in the midst of all of this, I just burst into laughter, right? Because there was this infectious joy. And folks, that's the kind of joy that we are after. Not a happiness that's just based on circumstance, but a joy that is deeper than anything that's happening in our lives. And, and, and happiness, happiness can happen by chance, but joy happens by choice. We, we choose to focus on the things of God and allow them to fill us with joy. Joy is a filling, it's not a feeling. I love what Dallas Willard um, says. He says, Joy is not the passing sensation of pleasure, but a pervasive sense of well-being 
that is infused with hope because of the goodness of God. I just want to read that again and just, just kind of absorb that a little bit. Joy is not the passing sensation of pleasure. That's, that's what most people are after. That's happiness. But a pervasive sense of well-being that is infused with hope because of the goodness of God. And when you focus on that, life is a joy no matter what's happening. So, so, where's, so what is joy? Joy is this pervasive sense of well-being that's based on the goodness of God and, and upon understanding his promises. So, so now then where does joy come from? Number one, joy comes from the person of Jesus. as the primary place where joy comes from. Other people, other people will let you down, right? I mean, isn't it amazing? We, we, we all think that kids will bring us joy and then we have them. <laughs> and they do sometimes. And then they don't sometimes. But I think we would all admit at the end of the day, they fill our lives with great joy, Right? But, but with every, every, that's the crazy thing about joy. It's always like, it's always like handcuffed to a burden. Like the, the joy of, the joy of children is, is the burden of parenting, right? That, that, that every joy has like this burden that's coupled to it. And, and, and so we have to work through the burdens to get to the joy. And you know, I, I mean, the, the joy of marriage is the communication and the, the burdens of all those things, right? And we keep working on those and working on those and working on those, right? And you will keep working on those and working on those and working on those. That's just what it is. But all of the difficulty doesn't take away the joy. Because joy comes from somebody where else. It is that deep sense of well-being because of the goodness of God. But, and, and, and so the present, it, it, it really comes from the person of Jesus. I, I love the story. It's part, kind of part of the Christmas story, the beginning part. Um, David shared it where Elizabeth, um, Mary's um, cousin, was pregnant. And, and she, was in, she was in her old age, right? She, she was like in her 70s probably, somewhere like that. And, and she finds out she's going to be expecting a child. She had wanted a child all of her life. She never expected it would be when she turned 70. And, and when you think about the joy of childhood, man, if, if I talked, especially to all the ladies in the room, and you said, okay, at 70 you're going to have a child, does that sound very joyful? <laughs> Not so much. And, and, and so, you know, but, but she finds out because after all of these years, after all of these years, God's promise comes true, and she has a child. But then Mary... Mary is told she's going to have a child. And, and Mary has all these questions like, well, hey, wait a minute. How is this going to happen? Because, like, yeah, I'm engaged, but we haven't, and so I can't, and I don't know how this is going to happen. No wonder it says she was troubled when the angel told her. And, and when you think about that, at the beginning of that thing, it doesn't sound like great news. And there is a burden to carry. Think about the burdens that Mary had to live with. I mean, her, her reputation in town is just like shot. And everybody has an imagination that is conjuring up all kinds of stories about how that happened. And especially when she's saying, well, that we, we really didn't. But everybody's mind is going, well, then how? And so there's this burden that she carries. And, and what's amazing is that just a, a few months into her pregnancy, um, she decides, you know, for, for whatever reason, she decides she's going to go visit. She's going to go stay with her cousin Elizabeth, who's already expecting. And it tells us this. It says, when Elizabeth, this is in Luke chapter 1, verse, starting in verse 41, it says, when Elizabeth heard that Mary's, Mary's greeting, when she, Mary arrived, it says, the baby leaped inside of her womb. And Elizabeth was, was filled with the Holy Spirit. And in a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child that you bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord would come to me? Now listen to this part, verse 44. He says, As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for what? Leaped for joy. 
Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promise to her. The baby left, what, what caused that baby to leap for joy? The presence, right? The presence of Jesus. When Jesus is present, there is joy. And, and, and so we, we want to make sure that, that we stay in the presence of Jesus. That's where I love that passage where John, John 15, 11 says, Jesus says, I have told you these things so my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Joy comes from being with Jesus. So here's the deal, if that's true, if joy comes from the presence of Jesus, if joy comes with being for Jesus, then here's, here's the thing that you got to ask. If you're not feeling joyful, then here's the question, or here's the statement maybe. Maybe it's because you're just not close to Jesus. Maybe if you're struggling with joy, that deep sense of well-being, maybe it's because your relationship with Jesus has either not been established or maybe you moved and you've distanced yourself from him. Because if you want real joy, it comes from being in the presence of Jesus. I mean, I, I believe that this is one of the reasons why God gave us this gift of prayer. Because, because it is there that we, 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 we can spend time in the presence of Jesus. And so we're actually going to start off the year, um, 2024, because it's going to be an insane year. We're going to start off the year with, with just a series on prayer because it's so important for us to just bathe ourselves and get ourselves in the presence of Jesus. Because joy, joy comes from being in the presence of Jesus. Joy, and then joy also comes from the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit. In Galatians 5, and 23, Paul says, the, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy. And joy is the second one there on the list. And then he goes on, he says, peace, forbearance, uh, right, which is patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there's no law. So again, it, joy is a filling, it's not a feeling. Joy is the natural byproduct of the Holy Spirit at work in your life. You, you can't just, it, it's a fruit that just, that comes out because the Holy Spirit's there. It's not something you produce, right? It's not something that you go, oh, I'm just going to be more joyful. In fact, all of the fruits of the Spirit are that way. Um, you can't just, like, make yourself produce them. I mean, think about this. Ha, I mean, have you ever tried to make yourself be joyful when you're, like, upset? It doesn't work. In fact, it makes you more frustrated. How many of you ever have tried to make yourself be more patient, right? And you're like, be patient, 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 and it just makes you less patient. That, when, when we fight the natural way that God has designed these things to be, it has the adverse effect. When you try to force yourself to be joyful, like, I'm going to do whatever, and what you will do if you're trying to force yourself to be joyful and it's not happening, you know what you will settle for? happiness, and you will find it in all kinds of places that you shouldn't, and then your happiness will turn to unhappiness, and then you'll start the cycle all over again. So what do you need? You need the presence of Jesus. You need the presence of God's Holy Spirit to produce this in you, and you can't produce it any other way. There is no other way to get, I mean, I, I, there's a lot of books out there. Um, my, my wife read a book not too long ago um, on, on this thing um, where, where it, was, it was all about like simplifying. And, um, and the, the gal who wrote the book, she, she said, um, it, it had something to do with joy, I remember. And she just said, you go in your closet and you hold up clothes and you just ask the question, does this bring me joy? And if it doesn't, then you get rid of it, Right? Um, but, but, but I would contend that that's, that that's not real joy, right? Because a sweater, now an ugly Christmas sweater can make you laugh. It can bring you happiness, but it can't bring you joy, right? Because stuff doesn't bring us joy. But what happens to us is if, if, if we're, we're on this quest, I think that's what David Tripp said, if we're on this quest for joy and, and, and the the thing is, you can only find it in the presence of Jesus. You can only find it when God's Holy Spirit is working in you. And, 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 and if it's not, if you're, if you're trying to force it some other way, then again, you will just keep trying and trying, and you will, you will fall for something short of the prize. 
and it won't fulfill. And so then you'll keep doing it over and over and over again. So joy comes by the presence of God's Holy Spirit in our lives. And, and so, so how, you know, how, how do we do that? Well, the, the Bible says when we accept Christ, we are filled with his Holy Spirit. But the Bible also tells us that we need to stay in step with the Spirit. That we need to spend time in, in his presence. And we'll get to that in just a second. But, and we need to spend time listening. We need to spend time in prayer. We need to do those things that allow us to be in his presence and, and really embrace the presence of Jesus in our lives. So joy also joy um, joy comes from having the right perspective. So how, how do we live joyfully? I, I want to touch on this really quickly. Well, first of all, joy comes from having the right perspective. In Colossians chapter three, verse one through four, it says, "Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things ab- uh, on things above." Where Christ is, right? If, if it comes from his presence, it says, think of things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, you will also appear with him in glory. What he's saying here is this, is that our perspective needs to be on, on things above, not the things of the earth. So you, you're not looking for earthly things to satisfy. We're satisfied by the reality that we have an eternity that is waiting for us in heaven. That we have an eternity that Jesus paid for, that he bought for us, and, and, and he wants to give to us. That should give us great joy. Great joy is knowing what is at the end. And we, we, we've been... You know, there's some people that have been doing um, training to do a 5K. I hurt my foot. It's kind of set me back. It's been kind of a bummer. But there's people who've been training. So those of you who have done it before, um, here's what I know. Now, there's some crazy people in the room that they can find joy just in the running. Right? I only find joy because there is a finish line. I find, and, and you know what's amazing is I can go and I can be, I can be running the whole time, I, the whole time, you know what I'm telling myself? I, I'm just going like, it's okay, it's okay, because the end will come. It's okay, it's okay, there's a finish line out there somewhere. It's okay, like just keep breathing. That's what I, I just have to, to remind me, just keep breathing. Keep breathing and you'll get there. Keep breathing and you'll get there. And then you turn the corner and there it is. It's amazing how much speed I pick up in the last like 100 yards. Right? Because the joy is at the finish line. And folks, I gotta tell you, as followers of Jesus, the joy, like this, this life can be hard. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of adversity. There's a lot of craziness in our world. The joy, friends, we can have it now, but the real joy is at the finish line. And you gotta know that you have that. And when you know that you have that, it can get you through the rest of it. And so the question for you this morning is do you know? Do you know that you have a relationship with Jesus and eternal life waiting for you? That, my friends, makes all the difference. And so it's from our perspective. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 and 3, it says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Uh, that, That one, man, I just had to sit with that verse a lot this week. It says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people would look at this and and, and think, wow, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. See, the joy is not in the cross. Okay? What was the joy that was set before him? The joy that was set before him was the resurrection and the power that that had to give every single one of us life so we could live in eternity with him in heaven. That was the joy that was set before him. Jesus was so filled with joy at the thought of spending eternity with you and me that he could go to the cross and endure all that pain and all that shame and all that hardship. He could do that, right, because he knew that it opened up the possibility that you could spend eternity with him. 
And so we put our perspective on eternity. An illustration I heard that just really hit me this week is some of you have, um, some of you know who Corey Temboom is. Um, uh, she's a lady who um, was in a Nazi concentration camp during World War II. And the story was told about a time that she was in the concentration camp, and every Friday um, they would bring all of the prisoners um, to this place, and they would strip them down naked and hose them down. That was basically the shower kind of thing for the week. And um, when they would get called out and they would be brought out, they didn't know if they were being brought out to head to the gas chambers or to, you know, the fire, or to the hose, right? And, and there were some people who, who was, were hoping at one point that they'd rather go to the gas chamber than, you know, get stripped down naked again and, and, and take the humiliation. And they would stand there in utter humiliation as the guards, as the guards would watch their feeble, withered, because of lack of food, bodies, and they would stand there and, and they would be hosed down. And, and there was a story because um, Corey Tembum's younger sister, Betsy, was in the line right in front of her. And as they stood there naked, Corey Tembum just whispered to her sister. She says, you know they took Jesus' clothes too. And Betsy looked back and said to her, oh, and I never thanked him for it. I mean, we talk about the cross, but, but Jesus w- was stripped naked and beaten, and he did all that because of the joy, because of the possibility of spending eternity with you. That is why Jesus did what he did. That is how Jesus endured the cross, was the thoughts of you and I in heaven with him forever. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 um, says, that, says this, Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For these light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not, as what, not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since, that, since what is unseen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. For we know that the earthly tent that we live in, if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God. An eternal house in heaven built, not built by human hands. That is our hope. That is our joy. Even when the storms around me, I have storms around me, I can live with joy in me because I have Jesus. So this morning, the, the question is, are you sure of your relationship with him? Are you sure of your relationship with God? Psalm 1611 says, you make known to me the path of life, and you fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. I I mean, do you realize what Christ has done for us? Folks, that every single day should bring us joy. He has given us the gift of eternal life. No matter what you have to face today, no matter what you have to face today, you have the joy of eternity that is waiting for you. So we find joy in the person of Jesus, in the presence of the Holy Spirit. We find joy in God's word. Psalm 19, 8 says this. The precepts of the Lord are right. they get giving joy to the heart. You really want to to have joy? Spend time in God's word. Psalms 119, 11 says, your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. God's precepts, his statutes, God's word brings joy. We need to find joy in God's word. You know, we're at the time of year where, you know, we're we're getting to the end of the year. People will make New Year's resolutions, right? And some people, and and I just want to invite you, invite you to to jump in. Um, I I know this last year, um, one of the greatest joys of my last year has been working through the Bible with a group of guys. Uh, um, There's a guy, he's sitting in the room. He calls our Thursday meetings when we get together and talk about what we've read. He calls it happy hour, right? right? But, but, but I truly believe it's like there is joy in God's word. There's joy. And, and, and I want you to just be absorbed with it. And if you want, and maybe you've tried to get through the Bible before and you never made it. If you did, come talk to me. We'll, we'll help you get through it this next year. 
um, because I've watched it change the lives of people that I've been doing this with. Spend time in God's word. It will bring you joy. And then, you know, and, and then serve others. Find joy in serving. Um, you know, I, I just got to tell you guys how, how proud I am to be part of a church that, that loves to serve. Um, this last weekend, um, uh, you know, I, we got home from Mexico at about 10 last night. I was just exhausted after, like, it's just a down and back drive. It's just, you're exhausted. But I got to tell you, there is so much joy. And, then, and, and here, here on our campus, we served, I, I, I mean, it's like, I, I, I don't know how many, like, I think it was like 400 or so families. It represents like 1,200 kids. And we've got some pictures here. Um, I think the first one's, yeah, this was, this was uh, yesterday here. People were just lined up all the way around this building. People from our own community coming to, to receive toys for their children. I think, yeah, there you go. That's what it looked like in our gymnasium as people came and went and they were able to grab toys. And then I love this little smile. I mean, that's worth it all, right? That right there is worth every bit of it. And, and so then down in Mexico, same thing happened. That's the street in Mexico. I mean, it's absolutely insane. That, that was, I think, that, I mean, that was like at 6 o'clock in the morning, the street is just absolutely jam-packed with people. And, and then we had uh, the privilege of, of, of handing those toys out. You can go ahead and advance that. I mean, and some of these little smiles just tell the story. Um, and it's absolutely amazing. I think we have a picture of our team there because I, I, I think I could ask any one of these folks, like, what, what was that experience like? And I got to tell you, man, when you give it all away, when you get spent, when you get spent on behalf of the kingdom of God, this insane thing happens. And I got to tell you, it, it, it's, it, it's one of the greatest feelings in the world. When you are absolutely exhausted because of the work that you do in the kingdom, God somehow infuses you with this joy that is unspeakable. I wish I could explain to you where exactly that came from or how that happens. All I know is this, is that our God is so good that when the, the, the more you spend yourself on behalf of the kingdom, the greater he fills you with joy. And I want that for every single one of you. And th there is nothing like serving people around you, whether it be here or elsewhere in the world. Folks, here's the thing, and this is why I'm so proud of our church. We changed the world yesterday. We spread joy yesterday. Here, across the border in Mexico, we spread the joy. And you know why? Because we took the presence of Jesus there. Amen. Yeah? Amen? <laughs> and there is no greater joy than that. You guys, you guys as a church family, you, you spread the joy to well, I, I'm, I'm going to guess it's well over 3,000 people because of what happened yesterday. Because you took time to fill up a bag and bring in and it got down to Mexico. Because you brought a toy and it got handed out yesterday. But it's all a vehicle. The toys and the bags and the, the traveling and the, all that stuff. Those are just vehicles to get the presence of Jesus near people. Because it's when the presence of Jesus gets close to them that they experience real joy. And so I just want you to get close to Jesus. Because he is the greatest source. And the closer you get to Jesus, the more joy you will have. And you know, one of the greatest examples of that comes from the Christmas story and the person of Mary. Um, we read her story at the beginning, right? And all these things happen. And, um, and I, I wanted you to hear as best we could from, from, from Mary today. Because she's the one that started off, and it, it did not look joy-filled. The circumstances were, were pretty, pretty crazy. So, so I asked somebody. Mary, Mary was a young gal, probably somewhere between 14 and 15 years old. And so I asked somebody to come and help me. So Peyton, will, will you come up? Come on up, Peyton.
How you doing, Peyton? Thank you for being here. <laughs> this is super fun because I, oh man, I remember when she was born. Oh. So, Peyton. Um, so, Mary was, you're, how old are you? I'm oh, I need, uh, the mic went away. I was going to say, you know what, can I just grab, uh, no? Yeah, sorry, we're going to get Mike. I totally forgot about that. Yeah. Thank you, guys. There you go. Yeah, you can hold that. There you go. Good job. So how old are you, Peyton? I'm 15. She's, oh, here, let's make sure that's on. Yep, yep, I think we're good. Test, test, maybe not. Yep, we're good. All right. So you're 15 years old, right? So Mary is about this age, right? So Peyton, um, so do you think may, do you think maybe one day you might want to get married or something someday? Probably, yeah. Probably, yeah. Okay. Um, would it be okay if we picked the person for you? I'm just, I'm, no, no. I'm just. <laughs> so, so here's, you know, they had the whole arranged marriage thing back in, you know, but that's how it worked back then, right? That would have been crazy. That would have been crazy for your life. I mean, how about your mom and dad? Could maybe they pick? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I mean, what, what would you think it would have been like if all of a sudden an angel showed up and said, hey, you're going to have a baby? I think I'd be terrified. Terrified? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and that was the story, right? That Mary was absolutely terrified. I mean, could you imagine, like, what would that have been like if you had to tell your parents that story? Crazy. <laughs> right? I mean, that would be nuts. But that's the story. And in the midst of all of that kind of the frightening, terrifying piece and the craziness of it, we have a picture into Mary's heart that is absolutely amazing. Because after all of this happens and after she visits Elizabeth, Mary breaks into song. You don't have to sing it. You're just going to read it, right? But, but I want you to listen to the words of Mary through someone who would have been about her age. And just listen to these incredible words from a girl who got a terrifying visit from an angel, who just found out that she was expecting, that had to go tell her fiance and tell her parents and all those other things, and then listen to her words. So Peyton's going to read Mary's song uh, for us. Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit re rejoices in God my Savior, for he is, has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and his holy, na holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm, and he has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from thrones, but he has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful, and to Abraham and his descendants forever, he, just as he has promised our ancestors. Hey, can we hear it for Peyton? Thank you. Did you hear those words from a terrified teenage girl, my soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he's been merciful to me. He's been mindful of the humble, humble state of his servant. Wow, what incredible words that this young get girl whose life has been turned upside down, but despite the circumstances, she exudes this incredible joy. Why? Because more than anybody else at that moment, she feels and understands the presence of Jesus. And maybe if you're here today, and you're thinking, man, life is, life is fearful, Life is crazy. The world is upside down, and, and I don't really feel a lot of joy. Well, I want to invite you this morning to step into the presence of Jesus. 
because he is the source of our joy. And if you've been struggling with joy in your life lately, Jesus is the answer for that. And if you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with him, I want to invite you into a relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The one who came at Christmas and gave his life for you and me so that we could have eternity to look forward to. Because that, my friends, is what brings real joy. And if you're here this morning as we as we close with another song about joy, I, I, I'm going to just say, hey, I'm going to ask some of our elders to just come up and maybe sit up front. I'll be right down here. If you want to just make your way up or just come after the song, if it's a little easier for you, we want to talk to you today because we don't want you to leave this place today without experiencing the great joy that comes from knowing Jesus. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your Son, Jesus. We thank you for the great joy we experience because of his presence in our lives and what he has done for us. And Father, we thank you today for the indescribable gift that you bring. God, would you help us be people who, because of your presence in our lives, we exude great joy to a world that is confused, a world that is frightened, a world that is crazy. Father, would you help us bring joy great joy to the world because of Jesus. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.